May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable. Amen. Okay, a little exercise. Where are my insomniacs? Okay, all right, just a few of you. How many of you wake up at least once in the middle of the night? Okay. A little more. How many of you take at least an hour to fall back asleep? Okay, it's small, but these are my people. <laughs> I wake up at 3 a.m., almost on the dot, every night. And I don't fall back asleep for an entire hour, gospel truth. This has been going on for at least five years, my entire relationship with Matt becoming part of a regular, even oddly comfortable routine. I don't wake up because I have to go to the bathroom. I don't wake up because of noise from our lovely puppy or from our hateful cats. I don't wake up because of Matt, who sleeps as soundly as a 31-year-old newborn cherub. I simply wake up, and I lie awake until at least 4 a.m. Ancient Romans called this time the hour of the wolf, a nightly spell when all of our darkest nightmares, all of our dar darkest, deepest fears descended upon us at the height of their powers. And Christians for centuries, thankfully, have spun a more positive take, calling it the hour of God counting it as a time when our souls might be uniquely open to prayer, obedience, and transformation. And some doctors simply say that as we get older, we naturally suffer from sleep fragmentation that breaks our night up from alternating periods of sleep and wakefulness and back and forth. I was hoping I might have a few more decades before I had to play the sleep fragmentation game, but it seems my 30s have welcomed the hour of the wolf god with wide open arms and wide open eyes. I would love to piously tell you that I spend this midnight hour meditating, but even as I try to model prayerful pastor Ness, I admit that my 3 a.m. wake-up calls fall more often into the hour of the wolf nightmare worry category than they do the hour of God peaceful prayer category. But over the past few weeks, something has shifted, and I've begun to hover somewhere between the two. Since the end of June, my 3 a.m. wake-up calls have started to fit more snugly into a middle category that I've dubbed the hour of wrestling. Now, this is not something that I read in a science book. It's just the feeling I get when I float between the nightmares of the hour of the wolf and the prayerfulness of the hour of God drifting in a space that doesn't totally terrify me, but also doesn't completely comfort me either. It's no longer simply a panicked time when I desperately ponder unanswered emails and phone calls, and it's most certainly not a time when I patiently pray. It's instead become an hour when I wrestle for the immediate reassurance I want so desperately, and God basically says, no, dig deeper. But thankfully, for a faithful insomniac like myself, this hour of wrestling has long-standing ancient roots. In our ancient testimony that Addy read, not only does one of our most famous Bible heroes, Jacob, find himself in a midnight wrestling match with God, but at the passage's end, when Jacob receives his new name, that new name, Israel, literally means to struggle, to wrestle with God. My sleep fragmentation has been religiously legitimized. I trace the genesis of my current hour of wrestling back one month to a June workshop I took with Ruby Sales, who was an amazing civil rights activist and is now a civil rights activist elder. 
and her wise words make up today's modern testimony. I spent two days with Sales and about a dozen other faith leaders interrogating the legacy of white supremacy in this country, pointing to the pains it has engendered in our society's roots and exploring ways that faith communities might counteract its festering tendrils with new, liberating theology. Now, as you heard Martha read, Sales isn't content to simply define white supremacy as something that brutalizes and dehumanizes black lives, as it most certainly has and as it most certainly continues to do. But she views white supremacy as a poison, a poison that has infected every body, especially white minds, convincing our collective memory that whiteness is a ruling behemoth that sits at the center of all and that everything else hovers around it, grasping for scraps of its power. In Sale's estimation, white supremacy has grown so insidious and so powerful over so many centuries that it has obscured the goodness that might lie at the heart of most white people leaving so many of us hobbled, even in our white skin, aching with the pain of wounds we can't remember causing or receiving, but complicit simply through our passed on poison. Now, I've continued to wrestle with Sales Clarion Call through the nights of July, and then last week, something else happened that threw my hour of wrestling for a loop. Sam Shepard, one of our most poetic playwriting voices and a Judson Poets Theater star, died. And as I awoke last Thursday morning at 3 a.m. on the dot, I realized something. Sam Shepard was not only a genius of dramatic language, he was also one of the most agile pointers to the pain that poisons the heart of white people. His characters are almost always poor white losers who have lost sight of a God who wants to guide them and love them and have given into a despair that can be too easily coupled with casual, careless racism and fear. And as in this morning's call to worship, Shepard's characters are always caught between knowing how poisoned they are and desperately trying to ignore how poisoned they are while they try to cheat their way out of responsibility. From the moment I saw my first Sam Shepard play, 4-H Club, up at Fordham University, I've recognized his characters in ways that make me entirely uncomfortable because they remind me of my own family. White people just trying to catch a break, trying to burrow their way into the elusive, illusory power promised by white supremacy. And this is how white supremacy works. It convinces people that there is something they need to obtain, sustain, and control, lest the entire fragile system crumble and someone else, someone less deserving, someone less white, snatch that fake something away. And I still remember the first time I heard a racial slur escape the lips of one of my beloved uncles. I couldn't have been more than six years old, and the detail that sticks most distinctly in my memory is how matter-of-factly and casually the slur was delivered. It was simply a sentence, like any other sentence. One more thread in the fabric of careless conversation, words of quiet hate springing from someone I loved. And even as we try to take closer looks at the most blatant racism in this country, these little slurs, these barely noticed tiny fissures of casual, unchecked racism slip from our grasp and sustain and undergird the oppression. That's how poison works. There are plenty of ugly, visible symptoms up top, but the root cause can lie obscured beneath the surface forever. 
Now, I have spent my life wrestling with racist statements I've heard from my own flesh and blood, but it's only now, in the past month, that I've begun to take this wrestling to a more active level because the poison is in me as well. No matter how liberal and progressive I get, my theology, my approach to church systems, my approach to art, my approach to everything centers around whiteness. It bears the poison of white supremacy. It's that insidious. So in a time when those in our country's highest positions of power are looking at the failures of white supremacy and trying desperately to warp it into something that looks different but feels the same, I mean, you can't get any more poisonous than investigating affirmative action. We of faith have before us an opportunity to rethink what church can offer a poisoned world. So what might the first step toward an anti-racism liberation theology from a traditionally white church look like? I think it looks a lot like midnight wrestling. Look at Jacob's ancient testimony midnight wrestling renaming session. Look at it next to the context of the rest of Jacob's story up till now. How many people know Jacob's story up to this point? Okay, cool, cool. Up to now, Jacob has been a trickster fooling his way through life, stealing blessings where he can, pulling the literal wool over his father's eyes, stealing a blessing from his own brother. He's poisoned everything he touches. And before he gets his nifty new God wrestler name, Jacob's name literally means holder of the heel and supplanter, as in Jacob literally holds on to others to pull them back and place himself above them. He's a cheater, a deceiver, a con man, and guess what? He's the hero of our story. Like white supremacy, he has centered himself and tricked those around him into rewarding his self-promoting demands. He's even tricked himself into not seeing his own poison, but he can't escape one thing. All of Jacob's trickery leads him to this dark night of the soul, a midnight wrestling match with the one being he can't fool or enslave. Who is it? God. Say it. Say it. God. And unlike all the humans that Jacob has deceived, God sees all of Jacob's tricks. God knows all of his pranks, and God is beyond being punked. And in wrestling God, Jacob isn't simply wrestling a mysterious deity. He's wrestling all that he has been in the past, all of the tricks he's employed to get where he is. He's unshackling himself from the poison. And sadly, I fear that our liberal white institutions have tricked ourselves into believing we are beyond racism, beyond those poor other white people who are so blatantly racist in other places. We all know people whose racism is mouthier than our own, but we have a liberal white problem. We have tricked ourselves into believing we're worthy of the blessing without actually wrestling for the blessing. I don't know how to quickly dismantle white supremacy, but as a faith leader and as a member of this faith community, I know that the first step toward it must include an hour of wrestling, both with God and with our own trickster selves. As Sam Shepard's characters in our call to worship realize, the first step is understanding that we see the poison in others because that's the same poison that has infected ourselves. Encountering that poison, 
wrestling that poison and inviting something larger than ourselves, something like God, to free us from this poison is the only thing that can point us past pain and toward liberation. Now here at Judson, we have begun to do this. We are currently pointing to the pain that white supremacy has wreaked in our liberal white systems and institutions. We know there is a problem. And because we are a church, that means we have deep theological work ahead of us. Our storytelling phase, our white love listens, gatherings have come and gone. And now our theological phase our re-articulation of ethics and values, our study of how we approach scripture, music, liturgy, to how we make justice, to how we make art, to how we make church, is about to begin. Over the past century, this congregation has created potent theological language that has changed how this country thinks about the relationship between ethics and God. Our theology built around sanctuary for immigrants is a liberation theology. Our theology built around the clergy consultation service and reproductive justice is a liberation theology. Now we are being invited to use our liberation theology muscles to re-articulate our approach to dismantling white supremacy, to use our voice to create theology that will wrestle us out of racism's grasp. It is time to actually look at our traditions, just as we've done for the liberative social justice actions we've taken in the past, and find the stories, the songs, the vocabulary that will support this dismantling. And we can't cheat. We can either choose to trick ourselves into simply being a white liberal institution here, or we can choose to wrestle ourselves into being a revolutionary voice. And the good news here is that you don't have to wake up at 3 a.m. to do it. We are in the hour of wrestling right this very moment, together. The trick isn't waking up. We've done that. The trick is committing to staying awake together until we truly earn a new name for ourselves. So look around you. These are the people with whom you are committing to do this wrestling work. Look, look at each other. And as we gather our elements for communion, Look one another in the eye. Ask how everyone is doing. Make sure everyone has something to eat and something to drink. And know that this work can only be done within a community who trusts that agape, agape will sustain our every move. I'll pull us back together in a moment. Go for it.